Yeshua promised in John 8.32, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The question is, free from what? Free from organized man-made religion and doctrines and commandments of men. Yeshua did not come to this earth to start a new religion or another religion, another church, another denomination. He came simply to reveal the character of his Heavenly Father to us and to point us back to the Torah of Moses. See Matthew 5, 17 to 18. The fact that we believe something to be true does not make it true. Don't forget that. Truth is truth whether we believe it or not. Truth stands on its own. Our study or presentation today is about the sins of Jeroboam. We want to find out what the sins of Jeroboam were and if Christianity possibly is repeating those sins today. Before I continue, I want to say that any of my presentations are not intended to be an accusatory pointing device or to condemn anyone. but to encourage individuals to study for themselves and to find out if these things are so, just like the Bereans did in Acts 17.11. Some things are hard to understand because of the way one has been raised, because of what one has been taught and things one has been accustomed to. However, truth is truth and we must be willing to learn and always have an open mind. What about King Jeroboam? At first glance, the story of uh, Jeroboam seems to bear little, if any, significance to Christianity today. King Jeroboam became an idolatrous king of ancient Israel who developed a system of worship that involved two golden calves. Because Christians today don't worship physical golden calves, it is easy to brush off Jeroboam's story while clucking our tongues and sanctimoniously. Shaking our heads at uh, his primitive folly, we then relegate the story to our mental backfile, classifying it as nothing more than of biblical trivia. Certainly, this kind of idolatrous foolishness doesn't go on among Christians today, or does it? Quite to the contrary, a deeper look into the details of this Bible story will reveal that it is extremely relevant to the followers of Yeshua today. Actually, Jeroboam's sin has become so widespread among Christianity that it has now become standard practice in nearly every church around the world. It is important then that we take a moment to search out the deeper insights of this biblical story, lest our worship be abominable in the eyes of Yahweh, as was Jeroboam's. Many nice people think that they worship the Creator and do His will when in reality they follow pagan practices and by doing so they honor the arch enemy, Satan. So let's ask the question, does Christianity as a whole repeat Jeroboam's sins?
Jeroboam's idolatry actually began hundreds of years before with the construction of the golden calf at the base of Mount Sinai. Here we find its precedent. As the picture shows, the Egyptian calf god was usually made of gold and was not a depiction of a single god. The solar disk representing the serpent slash sun god as the father of the calf god is shown on the head of the golden calf. Most Bible historians believe that the golden calf constructed by Aaron was like the one shown in this picture. Thus in the idolatrous golden image two gods were represented, the father the sun disk and the sun the calf. What blasphemy! But there weren't only two false gods represented before Israel that day as we can see in the next slide. There was a pagan trinity represented in that altar. The third deity Aaron helped the Israelites to present was female. It was not part of the golden calf itself, but rather was part of the altar. While Moses rightly destroyed the golden calf, he ground it up and gave it to the people to drink as a punishment for the idolatry. Its large stone altar base is still standing at the base of Mount Sinai, allowing us to verify the presence of this third God. As the picture shows, a fence is now constructed removing access to the stone altar site which once held the golden calf. But upon these stones are telling petroglyphs depicting the Egyptian bull god Apis and his cow wife Hathor. It is because a full pagan trinity was represented that Aaron referred to the golden calf not in the singular sense but in the plural. How can I say that? We need to read Exodus 32 verse 4 for that. It says, And he, Aaron, conceived them, the jewelry, at the hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Exodus 32, verse 4. It does not say, This be your God, singular, but it states, These be thy gods, plural. He is talking about more than just one God. In the Egyptian false religion, this bovine family represented the unholy trinity. They did not always appear in four-legged form. This was merely believed to be the form they took when they walked the earth. These deities were also known as the sun god Nimrod, with the moon goddess Sima Ramis being his wife. Their son was a false savior or antichrist called Tammuz. In more modern times, the sun god has supposedly manifested as a bull in his earthly travels. This teaching is the basis for the myth of Europa and the bull.
Europa, another name for Semiramis, now called Mary, was a virgin. The sun god noted her purity and beauty from above. The story says that he changed into a white bull, came to earth, enchanted Europa, carried her away and raped her. He then returned to the sky. As the story goes, this rape resulted in the birth of the sun god's son, sometimes represented as a calf. Horrifying and depraved as is this story, it is the basis for the name of the continent of Europe. It is also the pagan basis for the current Christian teachings on the Trinity. Totally steeped in pure paganism, this ancient teaching wasn't just isolated to places like Egypt and Europe. Throughout the false religions and pagan mythology of the world, the same Trinity can be found. They have different names, but the way they are worshipped and the holy days which honor them are always the same. These days include Christmas, December 25, the birthday of Tammuz, Easter, his resurrection, Lent, and the rest of the Christian calendar. Not only was Israel honoring the pagan trinity in their festival to the golden calf, they actually believed they were worshipping Yahweh in so doing. The Bible states in Exodus 32, 4-5, And he, Aaron, received them the golden jewelry at the hand and fashioned it, the golden calf, with the graving tool. After he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. They got the idea to make a golden calf from Egypt and the surrounding nations. However, in Jeremiah 10, 2-3, they were warned not to do that. Thus says Yahweh, Learn not the way of the heathen, for the customs of the people are vain. Even though they had detailed instructions from the Creator Himself, not to do this, they still followed the custom of the pagans, serving the no-gods. One must ask the question, why did they do it anyhow? Why did they continue to follow the customs of the pagans which are cursed? Ezekiel 33.11, Yahweh asked the question, Why will you die, O house of Israel? I cannot bless you, I cannot save you, as long as you disobey my voice. It was their choice to disobey. They were blinded by sin, by the things of this life. During the past 6,000 years, the invitation is being given to his people to separate themselves from the world, the idols, the traditions of men, and to follow his instructions, his laws, statutes, and judgments. Let us now examine the story of Jeroboam's idolatrous sin closer. A 
About 500 years after the Sinai Golden Calf Festival, Israel was divided and we have the divided kingdom. The question is, why was it divided? The Bible states in 1 Kings 11, 9 and 11, and Yahweh was angry with Solomon. Why was Yahweh angry with Solomon, the wisest and most blessed person on earth? It states in 1 Kings 11, 9, because his heart was turned from Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. What was Solomon's great transgression? His great sin against the Creator, Yahweh, that had appeared unto him twice. His heart was turned from Yahweh. The Bible speaks in 1 Kings chapter 11 about Solomon's idolatry. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians and Hittites, of the nations concerning which Yahweh said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, the Bible says. That was exactly what happened. We can read that in 1 Kings 11, starting with verse 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with Yahweh his Elohim, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of Yahweh, and went not fully after Yahweh as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burn incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Then it states in 1 Kings 11, 9-10, And Yahweh was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from Yahweh the Elohim of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which Yahweh commanded. And then it continues in verse 11, Wherefore Yahweh said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rent the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Therefore the divided kingdom. About 500 years after the making of the golden calf at Sinai, the kingdom was split. Yahweh had promised Jeroboam ten tribes, 1 Kings 11.31. So Jeroboam ascended to the northern throne, reigning over ten tribes, while Rehoboam ruled the southern tribes of Judah.
What was his decision to prevent that to take place? The northern king Jeroboam was afraid he would lose his kingdom if the people visited Jerusalem in the south to worship and keep the Feast of Tabernacles according to divine instructions. See 1 Kings 12.27 Jeroboam made two fateful decisions. First, he created two golden calves, like the Trinity calf Israel set up after leaving Egypt in 1 Kings 12.28. And secondly, he set up new feast days on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah. See verse 32. This festival was a counterfeit of the Feast of Tabernacles, which begins on the 15th day of the 7th month, Leviticus 23.34, exactly one month earlier than Jeroboam's man-made feast. Jeroboam led the northern tribes into a Torah rebellion. The Bible says, So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. 1 Kings 12.33 Like Aaron of old, Jeroboam led the people into false trinity worship and he substituted the pagan system and man-made times of worship in the house of El. Bethel means house of El, a house of God. Archaeological evidence shows that Jeroboam's calf was set up for Yahweh worship, just like that of ancient Israel. They actually thought they were worshipping Yahweh. The idols were even referred to as the bull calves of Yah, as is explained in Abingdon's Bible Commentary. The name Igilia, bull calf of Yah, on a path heard from Samaria shows how far-reaching was the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Page 119, F.C. Isolan, Edwin Lewis, etc. According to Genesis 1.14, the heavenly lights were created to serve for the time when days, years, and religious festivals begin. That's Genesis 1.14 of the Good News Bible. These holy appointment times instituted at creation had been set in place by Yahweh himself. Yet now the king dared to set aside Yahweh's appointed times, replacing them with man-made days. This was nothing short of open rebellion against Yahweh, carried out under the sanctimonious guise of righteous worship, but for selfish reasons. The king's bold defiance of God in thus setting aside divinely appointed institutions was not allowed to pass unrebuked. Even while Jeroboam was officiating and burning incense during the dedication of the strange altar he had set up at Bethel, there appeared before him a man of God from the kingdom of Judah sent to denounce him for presuming to introduce new forms of worship. New forms of worship. 
What were these divinely appointed institutions Jeroboam had set aside? Specifically, the Feast of Tabernacles, according to 1 Kings 12.27. Question, has this happened in Christianity today? Have they removed the divinely appointed feasts and substituted them with pagan ones? Absolutely. We need to remember that at the very seat of the controversy between our Elohim and Satan, who was once Lucifer, is a particular issue of worship. Yahweh rightfully claims the worship of his created and redeemed beings. Satan has made the blasphemous claim that he will be just like the Most High. You can read that in Isaiah 14, 13-14. Satan, a created being, covets the worship which rightfully belongs solely to the Creator. So how does he try to accomplish this? One way he did it is by replacing Yahweh's feasts, festivals by festival, with his own or man-made holy days. Here we have Christmas. And the whole world follows thinking they honor the Creator by doing that. Christmas is a strictly Roman Catholic word. All of the customs of Christmas predate the birth of Yeshua and are a collection of traditions and practices taken from many cultures and nations. Yeshua was not born on December 25. This date was celebrated because of the birth of Tammuz. Think about it. Can we worship and honor the Creator? by involving ourselves with customs and traditions which he himself forbade as idolatry? Can we convince him to somehow Christianize these customs so we can enjoy ourselves? Can we obey through disobediences? Yeshua, our Savior, does not belong into Christmas. It is 100% Baal worship. Then you have Easter. Easter comes from a form of the name Astarte, a Chaldean Babylonian goddess known as the Queen of Heaven. That is mentioned in Jeremiah 7:18:44. In 17, 1925, and 1 Kings 11, 5, and verse 33, and 2 Kings 23, 13. Many creditable services substantiate the fact that Easter became a substitute festival for the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then there is Halloween. As with Christmas and Easter, church leaders adopted this ancient celebration to serve their own purposes. The Christian festival, the Feast of All Saints, commemorates the known and unknown saints of the Christian religion, just as Samhain had acknowledged and paid tribute to the Celtic deities. You can read that in the Encyclopedia of Religion, page 177. Then we have Lent. There are no instructions in the Bible to observe Lent. A 40-day abstinence period was anciently observed in honor of the pagan gods Osiris, Adonis, and Tammuz. This is in John Lancier, Sabean Researches, pages 111 and 112. 
Alexander Hislops. What about Happy Valentine's Day? Centuries before Yeshua, the pagan Romans celebrated February 15 and the evening of February 14 as an idolatrous and sensuous festival in honor of Lupicus, the hunter of wolves. That is from the Encyclopedia Americana. So what happened to the Creator's appointed yearly festivals? Would that be a fair question? They got lost within his own professed people and were replaced with pagan holidays. Here we have a letter from T. N. Wright, Bishop from St. Alphonsus Church, St. Louis, from June 1905. He says, The Catholic Church abolished not only the Sabbath, but all the other Jewish festivals, the annual holidays. But this apostasy is not to continue in those who will be ready to meet the Heavenly King. There's more than the days of worship to be restored if we would completely suffer from modern calf worship, like Jeroboam's golden calf worship, our sin against Yahweh is twofold. Not only had King Jeroboam dared to set aside Yahweh's days of worship, substituting in their place his own man-made days, he had all the mixed pagan trinity worship into the service of Yahweh. On the next slide we have a quote from Peter Eckler in the History of Christianity. If paganism was conquered by Christianity, it is equally true that Christianity was corrupted by paganism. The pure deism of the first Christians who differed from the fellow Jews only in the belief that Yeshua was the promised Messiah was changed by the Church of Rome into the incomprehensible dogma of the Trinity. Many of the pagan tenets were retained as being worthy of belief. Now that's uh, by Peter Eckler, History of Christianity. The first vital step in paganizing Christianity was the induction into the Trinity doctrine. Most Christian denominations in the world today teach the Trinity doctrine, which is the union of the three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, into one Godhead. Even though Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, neither in the New Testament nor in the Old Testament. The Trinity is not a Christian idea and does not reflect accurately the teaching of the first followers of the Messiah regarding the nature of God. The formulation one God in three persons was not solidly established prior to the 4th century. During the days of the Apostles, the Gospel was taught with accuracy, but after their death it did not take long for the truth to become eroded with falsehoods. This erosion of Biblical truth grew like a cancer, slow but sure. Little by little falsehoods crept in as the gospel message of Yeshua became more popular. In an effort to increase the church membership, 
the church became more and more a business. Many pagans were brought in, and with the pagans came pagan ideas. Rituals began to replace serious Bible study, and difference in opinion soon became the basis for growth of various creeds and sects. Over the span of years, man-made rites became time-honored tradition. Christian leaders then became powerful forces in the church as well as in politics. Religious beliefs, many times, were dictated by the state. All this had been prophesied that it would take place. We read in Second Peter chapter 1, 20-21 and chapter 2, 1-3, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. And many will follow their licentiousness, and because of them the way of truth will be reviled, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Here we have a quote. It says, Many scholars believe that the Trinity, as taught by Christians, comes from Plato, as suggested in the Timaeus, but the Platonic Trinity is itself merely a rearrangement of older Trinities dating back to earlier peoples. And that's from this source down here. In Indian religion, there is a Trinitarian group of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. In Egyptian religion, there is a group of Neph, Pitas, and Osiris. In Phoenicia, the trinity of gods were Ulumus, Ulusurus, and Ilion. In Greece, there were Zeus, Poseidon, and Adonius. In Rome, there were Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto. In Babylonia and Assyria, there were Anus, and Illinois, and Aeos. This is uh, by Paul Johnson from 1938, published, published by Johnson, Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. As mentioned before, the doctrine of the Trinity does not appear in the Bible, nor did Yeshua and his followers intend to contradict the Shema in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, or as it's um, translated in the scriptures, Yahweh our Elohim is one. Deuteronomy 6.4 The doctrine developed gradually over several centuries and through many controversies, and by the end of the fourth century the doctrine of the Trinity took substantially the form it has maintained ever since. And this is from the New Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume 10. But wait a minute. What about the Gospel Commission in Matthew 28, 19? It states in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Did you know that this verse was changed in the second century?
Matthew 28.19 was changed by the Catholic Church as recorded in the Catholic Encyclopedia number 2, page 263. It says, The baptismal formula in Matthew 28.19 was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost by the Catholic Church in the 2nd century. According to eyewitnesses, Eusebius was the church historian and bishop of Caesarea from 275 to 339 AD. He quoted, apparently 18 times, the early book of Matthew that he had in his library in Caesarea, according to this eyewitness of an unaltered book of Matthew that could have been the original book or the first copy of the original of Matthew. Eusebius informs us of Yeshua's actual words to his disciples in the original text of Matthew 28:19. Here is the original version according to the Demonstratio Evangelica by Eusebius on page 152. With one word and voice he said to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That agrees with Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That agrees also with Acts 19.5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Yeshua. In the words of the Pope Benedict, Catholic Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger made this confession about the origin of the chief Trinity text of Matthew 28.19. He says, The basic form of our Matthew 28.19 Trinitarian profession of faith took shape during the course of the 2nd and 3rd centuries. In connection with the ceremony of baptism, so far as its place of origin is concerned, the text Matthew 28:19 came from the city of Rome. What about the verses in 1 John 5, 7 and 8 in the next slide? For the first 1,000 years, these crossed out portions and the next slides didn't appear in the Greek text. Then around 500 AD, this portion appeared in the Latin version known as the Vulgate. Historically, it is known and identified as the Johannine Kama. History of Changes in the Bible For there are three that bear record, and the Spirit, and the Water, and the Blood, and these three agree in one. So those crossed out words were not in the original. They were added later. This here is taken from the Seventh-day Adventist Biblical Research Institute. It states, when Erasmus published his version of the Greek New Testament, he left out the additions to 1 John 5, 7 from his first two editions in 1516 and 1519, arguing that he could not find those words in any Greek manuscript. Pressure by some Catholics to include this addition to the Greek text, Erasmus proposed that if they could show him a single Greek manuscript, in which the edition was found, he would include it in his next edition.
Sure enough, they came up with a Greek manuscript in which the edition was found. One, scholars believe, it was dated from the 16th century AD, translated from Latin to the Greek and added to the Greek text. Erasmus subsequently included it in his 1522 edition of the Greek New Testament. Suspicious text. Out of 113 manuscripts, the text is wanting in 112. It occurs in no manuscript before the 10th century, and the first place the text occurs in Greek is in the Greek translation of the Acts of the Council of Lateran, held in AD 1215. This is taken from the Bible commentary on 1 John 5. Here is what the Catholic Church states by Cardinal Hosius. We believe in the doctrine of the triune God because we have received it by tradition, though not mentioned at all in Scripture. Well, I'm glad that he is honest and admits where it came from. Let's remember the Trinity Doctrine is a hub of pagan doctrine. Actually, the heart of paganism is a teaching that there is a Trinity. From this foundational center flow all other devilish doctrines, 1 Timothy 4.1, like spokes radiating out from a wheel hub. Today this teaching is readily accepted, believed and practiced, and no one thinks that it could be false, or being actually pagan worship. Having Christianized pagan principles, it isn't surprising to find that the teaching of the Trinity is so pivotal to Catholicism that it is the single most essential teaching of their faith. Upon it stand or fall all other doctrines, including the substitution of Sabbath for Sunday. Here's a handbook for today's Catholics, page 12. For March 1994, it states, The mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all other teachings of the Church. In fact, according to Theodosius, in a Catholic edict given in 380 AD under Constantine, so Catholic has uh, the paganized trinity teaching become that any Christian espousing this doctrinal belief is considered by the papacy to be a Catholic Christian. Whoever believes in the trinity doctrine is considered a Catholic Christian by the papacy. What do you think about that? And here is the actual quote. It says, Let us believe the sole deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost under an equal majesty and a pious trinity. We authorize the followers of this doctrine to assume the title of Catholic Christians and as we judge that all others are extravagant madmen. We brand them with the infamous name of heretics. They must expect to suffer the severe penalties which our authority guided by heavenly wisdom shall think proper to inflict upon them. Today the pagan concept of the Trinity has become so popularized throughout Christentum that one cannot join the ecumenical Christian community 
without accepting it. This is a requirement today in order to be accepted or to be acknowledged as a Christian. But Trinitarianism wasn't part of the Reformation doctrines. In fact, it may surprise you to learn how many Protestant churches were founded by deists, believers in one God. Do some research on your own and you will be surprised. The question is, why did they change? because they wanted to be accepted and be part of the ecumenical movement. So is that true or is it not true? Long ago, in a nearly forgotten Bible story, the king of Israel led Yahweh's people into two grievous sins, the worship of Yahweh on man-made days and the worship of Yahweh in pagan Trinitarianism. These were the two sins which characterized the golden calf worship of Jeroboam. Following the pattern of Aaron at Mount Sinai. And how did the Heavenly Father respond to this supposed honor of his name? Yahweh was incensed both times. Will he accept that kind of worship today? Will he let people change his instructions to their liking or opinions? Remember Malachi 3 verse 6. For I am Yahweh, I change not. How does it stand with your soul? Are you willing to obey him and his instructions no matter what someone else may think of you? Are you willing to let go of the traditions of men and follow your Savior with all of your heart, mind and soul? You and I have the choice. Do your doctrines and worship of Yahweh follow scriptural instructions? Or have you inherited the lies of golden calf worship, unknowingly mixing the worship of our sacred king with that which is pagan and profane, maybe unknowingly? Have the scales of long-held pagan beliefs just fallen from your eyes, revealing that you have stood with Jeroboam? If so, take heart. It is not too late to repent and turn from all traces of golden calf worship. Check these things out for yourself, personally. Don't take anyone's word. The latter rain is falling in the call to return to the Torah. The law of Moses was the statutes and judgments, according to Malachi 4.4. 4. Deuteronomy 32 states, My doctrines shall fall as a rain, my speech shall distill as a dew, as a small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Could we be living in the time of sealing now? What is the seal of Yahweh according to Isaiah 8.16? My friends, the seal is the Torah. 
which includes the weekly Sabbath, Exodus 28 to 11, but not only the seventh day Sabbath, but also the yearly Sabbaths, the feast days, see Exodus 13, 8 to 10, and thirdly, all of the other statements and judgments, see Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. And logically, what would be the mark of the beast? It would be all the doctrines, teachings, and commandments of men, which includes Sunday worship and all of the other pagan holidays like Christmas, Easter, Halloween, St. Patrick's Day, Valentine, April Fool's Day, etc. Let's heed the call of Yahweh in 2 Corinthians 6, 17-18. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith Yahweh Almighty. It is my prayer that we accept Yahweh's offer to stay away from these abominations and do not touch the unclean things so he can accept us as his sons and daughters. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom.